Hello. Welcome to Football Journeys, a B5 consultancy podcast presented by me, Matt Hemsworth. And me, Fraser Franks. Football Journeys is a podcast that ignores the glitz and the glamour of the beautiful game in favour of the pain, the graft and the rejection. Uh, For my part, I've been a media lawyer for nearly 20 years now and I work with clubs and I work with players to help protect their reputation, their privacy, but ultimately it's about protecting the well-being of the young men and women uh, that go through that journey through the game that we love. And for me, I've been through that journey. I was an academy player at Chelsea and Brentford before setting on a career in the lower leagues with the likes of Luton Town, Stevenage and Newport County. Before my career ended at the age of 28, I went into a heart defect. B5 Consultancy is about combining that experience to help players young and old, um, to make good decisions off the pitch, uh, but also to be there to support players when life doesn't go according to plan. In this series, we're talking to Liverpool FC's class of 2013-14. Those lads that came through that famous academy at Kirby, but didn't quite make it through to realise their Anfield dream. This is Football Journeys. In this episode, we pick up where we left off from our meeting with Manchester's Darius Waldron. This is part two of a two-part podcast, so if you haven't listened to part one, go back and listen to that first. We start off with Darius summarising where we got to at the end of part one. So it was crazy. I got no job. I don't, I'm playing football, but barely. I live at home with my mum, celebrating my best mate's 21st, and now I'm under investigation. Um, they cleared me for the murder, but they... They said that I'm still in the investigation for violent disorder. Um, this was, so this is now the beginning of October um, 2017. My head's all over the, the place. I don't know what's going on. Um, my best pal from football, Ryan Kent, he's just gone on loan to SC Freiburg in the Bundesliga. Um, he lived there in an apartment and he knew what had happened. And I just, I went, I said to him, you know, could do with some time away and he was all for it. He was on his own out there and, you know, we were best pals. So we, I went out there and I stayed with him for about three weeks. So you're bailed at this point, they're investigating it. You're I'm, just waiting to hear what. I'm bailed at this point. Um, I'm only under investigation for violent disorder. They've cleared me of anything else. Right, but so as soon as they were established, the blood was all over yeah, your yeah. and that's out the window. Yeah, it's out the window. So in that year, you've gone from, I know things were not perfect to Liverpool, but you know, you've know you had opportunities to be over at Melwood, train with first team players, and then that. Yeah. Um, in, before I left Liverpool in 2015, um, my last few training sessions was actually last few months I spent a lot of time at Melwood making up numbers. Um, my final training sessions were um, with the likes of Lucas Lever, uh, Philippe Coutinho, uh, Luis Suarez, Jordan I was just breaking through, me and Raheem already had a close connection, um, I think he may have been gone by the time. Um, Iago Aspas was there, Emery Chan, like talking like fully fledged established players um, and I'm now there training with them making up the numbers. Um, Happiest time at Liverpool. Some horrible times, but training with Luis Suarez and, and Philippe Coutinho um, and having them opportunities in 2015 in May, like, it was, you know, I have so many great memories of the club, so, you know, to be speaking about the bad one so much, um, it, there was some great times. Some people are never going to be able to do that or say they've, they've done that in their life, but. Going from yeah, going from May two thousand and fifteen to training with Suarez to be you know under arrest for suspicion of murder in October in two thousand and seventeen, the contrast is huge. Um, and then I spent October at, in Freiburg in Germany. I came home in November. I needed a job and decided to take an, a scholarship at a company called UK Fast. And they were a company who specialised in cloud hosting, internet cloud hosting, and internet security. Um, they have clients such as the NHS, Foot Asylum, um, Boots, like big brands who use online payment services, and you know, they, which you can imagine they made a lot of money through the pandemic with online shopping and, and things like that. Um, I'm still under investigation. Uh, on bail. I joined a week before I turned 21. I was on £900 a month and it was not where I envisioned myself to be um, when I left Liverpool. Um, I have a court date 
uh, February 2018 now um, for, the, for the same thing. Um, and there was, therefore, I had to tell my company, who you know, I'd be employed, that I'd, I'd, I've got this coming up. Um, this happened on the night out. However, due to what I actually, my involvement and my actions were on the night, you probably won't serve time. Um, and that was the influence I was under the whole time, really. Um, but in 2018, I joined that job and it was, it was crazy. I was only on £900 a month. Um, they were giving me like, like low responsibility jobs. And then like they seen that, you know, regardless of the money I was earning, it, they're a huge company. Um, and I only got to realize that as I worked there, you know, for a, a longer period of time. But they also made you feel like you were part of them. Where just because then I work, just because I was an apprentice on 900 pound a month, it, it didn't make me feel like I was at the bottom of the pyramid. I was doing jobs that would usually carried out by people at the top of the pyramid. Um, for me, it wasn't really about the money. It was, the, it was about the fact that they believed in me and thought that, you know, this, this kid can carry out what we need him to do. And although it's nothing to do with football, I, I, it, it kind of, it fulfilled like a little hole that had been there for a long, long time. Um, so I, it was great. I, I didn't just do that when I was back. I, you know, I'd, I'd do things at the, in the company in the office that were um, regarded as like heavy responsibility jobs and got my, my pay rise and stuff. And them first few months just made me feel valued again. Um, it's a common thread in it. It's like yeah. your experiences through Liverpool, you jump at the chance of going to the wrong college possibly in America because they make you feel valued and you're desperate to be part of a team. and be loved almost and then you're doing the same here as as soon as someone you know includes you and makes you feel part of it then you're in and that's yeah you, know, you, you jump straight into it instantly so it, that, that's what I, I felt that you know from them straight away from that early all 2018 and I, the difficult thing for me was that even I was doing I was progressing really well with my apprenticeship and I was due to complete it at the end of 2018 however I also had a court case pending over my head um, that at some day is going to have to be dealt with, whether I'm going to be, you know, guilty, not guilty, whatever. It gets to the early months of 2018 and it's still hanging over my head, but I'm in communication with my solicitor, my barrister and, and whatnot. Um, and we kind of come to the conclusion as a team together that what, what had happened and the events that took place that I probably wouldn't, or we were hoping that I wouldn't uh, be sentenced to the prison time because I, w I wasn't going to plead not guilty to, cause to open a trial essentially, it could have gone on for years. Um, so um, with your legal team you've decided you're not likely to get a custodial sentence, you, in your view is the judge is going to look at you as someone with no previous and a good record at Liverpool Football Club and a lot to lose if a custodial sentence is given and so that's the mindset you get to after loads and loads of delays, it's so typical in the court system in this country. We've got 18th of January 2019 on the horizon for you. Yeah. That is the day in which you are going to be, you've pleaded guilty or pled guilty and you are going to be sentenced. Um, what did that date mean to you as you were leading up to it? As soon as it hit January, it's like I, something changed. Um, even my, my boss at work said that he, you know, he'd picked up on it, even though he knew that I had it coming up, that, you know, um, I was a little different in work and stuff, a little quieter. Um, but yeah, um, the 18th of January comes, um, I'm getting ready for court, like this is, this is it now, like I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready for whatever, whatever is uh, going to be said and me and my two core defendants arrived at 9am on that day um, and the sentencing comes around 2pm and um, we, we stand up and um, yeah, the, the judge comes to the conclusion that um, that we were three or more people acting in a violent or disorderly way and that's the actual charge in what I was sentenced to. Um, two of us were sentenced to 30 months and the other one was sentenced to 56. And that was gut-wrenching because not only did, not only have we all just been sentenced to um, custodial time, uh, my best friend from, you know, over a decade, uh, that probably the closest friend that, that I have now is um, probably going to be serving double, if not more, than what what I am. Um, because once 
we all pled guilty to to the the violent disorder charge. Um, you take a third off, so I was just slashed at twenty months, um, and then you do ha you serve half of that custodial time. So I ended, I ended up serving ten months, and Kobe Co Co ended up serving ten months as well. And um, my best pal Tyler, he's, he's as we speak now, is um, still serving his custodial time. Darius's friend Tyler received a longer sentence or into a separate set of charges that were unconnected to the night in question. I remember just like the loudest scream just come from the bottom of my lungs because I thought like there's I just couldn't like like you said, like couldn't believe it, gone from playing from, you know, one of the biggest clubs in in the world, um, biggest clubs in this country for sure. And you know, like a couple of years ago and now I'm like staring prison down the face. Um, so now we're, we're walking back down the court, like hallway, straight to the um, to the security vans and carted off to HMP Forest Bank. And Tyler, because his sentence um, was going to be longer than ours, he went to Strangeway straight away. So we were separated. Uh, two went to one prison, and he went to the other. Um, so in, at that moment, you know, our families and friends. Um, we were in the box next to us and we were just lifted and, and carted away and that's the last time. Um, Who was there for you? I think t two sisters, my mum, um, and all my the co-defendants, their mums and their sisters were there as well. So we, we arrived to prison that evening, um, about 5pm, 6pm, we are in a holding bay. Um, we were stripped off, put in pr uh, prison tracksuits. Um, How does it feel on that, on that first night in prison when it, you know, it strikes home that this, this is home, and this is yeah, this yeah. going to be for you know the best part of a year. It 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 didn't really hit home. It was like it wasn't it wasn't real. You know, all of a sudden we're, I'm on a bunk bed. Um, I've got five channels. Um, you know, I'm in a prison tracksuit with like prison pumps. Um, we arrive like late at night and seven in the morning. The doors are cracked and the whole wings on the whole wings are like open roaming the wing and we're just two new lads who no one's seen before. Um, the toilet facilities? Um, toilet facilities just uh, in the corner of the room with like a board um, in front of it, but you can obviously hear, see, still uh, everything. Um, but we, I think you just, we, I got over that during time, but um, we were both put uh, on a wing, but we were split up um, in different cells. So I had a new pad mate on Monday um, and he had, a new, he had a new pad room. mate. Obviously, when he, you're in prison, you know you're in, people are in prison for a reason. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you're, a, no. you're a tough streetwise lad, but you're getting put in a cell with some bloke. You don't know who he is, you don't know why he's in there. Yeah. What, how's it daunting? That must be so daunting. Daunting, yeah. Um, I'd, I'd turned up, um, I'd, I had no bags or anything because I, I didn't expect to be going to jail, so there's no clothes or anything like that. Um, there's this, I open the door and there's just this lad sat on, it, on the bottom bunk and like there was a um, a vacant bunk above him, the top bunk and um, people will tell you who have been to prison that the, the bottom bunk is probably more of the, um, like, like it's your cell, <laughs> kind of, um, the alpha. yeah, the alpha, you know, or they might have just been in there longer than you, you know, like there's a respect level there. Um, but uh, he was a, a Manchester lad. Um, he was smaller than me, so I thought if anything does happen, is that so like, you looked at straight away instantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I just thought, like if <coughs> if anything occurs before I even know what he's in for, like because I've never been in a situation before that at least I should be able to defend myself unless he's got a weapon, which should, I didn't have a clue. You, when you, you know you, you step into this environment, and do you feel like you have to give this tough image? Um, do um, you feel like you have to act a certain way? Yeah, definitely. Um, you, it was over the weekend. You like you realise that the the minute that you, um, you you enter a jail and you you're easily influenced or you're manipulated, um, that's picked up on by everybody. That's that's there. So that can how how you often the case how you start your jail time is probably how you're going to go for it. Um, f you know, throughout your whole sentence. And I knew that. Um, even though I, I just start, started the sentence, I knew that it wasn't years or it wasn't, you know, it was going to come to an end, but I was just at the start of it. So I didn't want to give anybody the idea that they could, say, mess with me or, you know, 
come and take anything because that's that's what like that's what happens and that's what like it happened to me at Risley, which I'll move on to. Um, and I walked in and we, we exchanged names and I know you won't mind. Um, Jake, he's called. Um, he was a 23 year old lad, so the same age as well. How old was I? 20. I just turned 22 in the December before. Um, he was 23. Um, same age and we pretty much quickly got to you know what we was in for and I told him and he just simply replied with two attempt murders, um, supplying class A drugs and section 18 stabbing with intent to wound. Wow. So obviously it's an opening gambit when you're sharing a, an enclosed space with someone, isn't it? Yeah, when he he would only been in um, he'd only been in three months and he, he only needed to say two attempt murders for me to be like <laughs> like yeah really like you <laughs> so um you know we'd like he, he, just, he was a rough kid um he'd had it tough I think he'd, he'd been in and out of care since the ages of 10 um which obviously i went on to found out to find out sorry um but as we're speaking i was i'm slowly like gathering these feelings and thoughts about it and i'm thinking like what's what's led you to then become an attempt murderer and you know a, a class a drug supplier and you know Section 18 and whatnot, and um, that was the that first day was the 21st that Monday. That was the beginning of our relationship. Um, he then became the only person that I even knew, uh, I, the name of really. Me and Kobe didn't speak to anybody over the whole weekend, um, and yeah, the, them early days. Um, he was probably the most the biggest influence on what kept me going. Um, at the, at, you know, in the first couple of weeks, first few weeks in Forest Bank, mainly because of his 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 ways. Um, re, you know, I quick I quickly forgot. Like you quickly forget what he was in for, and it was more the fact that once he'd once he'd realised that like I was all right and I was you know a normal like normal lad myself. I say, um, he we pretty much he pretty much gave me like half of what he had, and anything that he ever had in the in the weeks leading up to, he also gave me that as well. Um, he helped me with finding things like, um, you know, ordering the foods at the right time, sorting out my menus, um, organising how to get my clothes into the prison, stuff like that. Um, really was just like, just this helpful guy. Um, and then it was just, I don't know, after the, after the first two weeks, I mean, I was distraught every day, just in the cell, quiet. Um, if I was going to speak to anybody, it was just, it was him. And I started just engaging in activities that some of the, lad, the lads did. Um, everybody's got this idea that you go to jail and you come out looking like Hulk. Um, and <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not the case because you, to, to actually access the gym in a jail, you need to earn a job in the jail. And then you need to consistently show them that you can be trusted over a period of time. And then you become an enhanced prisoner, which will allow you to have more access to the gym so it's not like you just go in gym every single day and um, so I was, it was just usual routine the first month um, I'd wake up breakfast 7 till 7.45 lock back up till lunch uh, lunch so was back in your cell after the breakfast yeah yeah back in your cell I didn't have a uh, cell I didn't have a job um, I'd only just arrived in the prison um, the best thing the best thing happened to me in Forest Bank was enrolling on um, because as I mentioned about getting a job um, I didn't realize that there was a, a coaching course that w they put on oh, um, football coach. yeah yeah um, and it was run it's run by a man called uh, Andy Thorpe and one of the coaches uh, called Anthony Smith uh, he was the coach for Forest Bank and I enrolled on that course for about three weeks after and that just changed everything completely uh, completely um, I was going from getting up doing nothing and pretty much all day to waking up, having a schedule. So I'm waking up, breakfast, uh, we could be out on the astral turf at 8.30 um, and then back in at 10.30 and then I might, I'll be, I'll be chilling with my, my pad mate Jake, we'll be waiting for lunch. After lunch, because then I'd go at two o'clock, the schedule would be to go back to do a second session um, in whatever job or education course you've taken up. Um, and Anthony just changed everything. Like, it was a chance to play football inside jail. So that, to me, was it was just a jackpot. Um, it was the, my golden ticket out of 
everything. My it was my escape every day. Um, I almost treated it like a, a training session. Like, um, <laughs> let's know that you're an ex Liverpool player. Um, they don't until the minute we start playing football, <laughs> and then difficult to hide it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's difficult to well, hide what's it. A, what's dare I ask? What's the standard of the lads that you're playing football with in prison? Um, dreadful, <laughs> to be to be put it quite plainly. Um, it, it's a real mixed bunch of you know lads that have played a little bit, played never, and because I mean they must they must have had some kind of interest in football to re want to join that course and to get on the course it's about 15 lads and you had to be at a low risk um you know there's, there's, there was a many qualifications you needed just to actually enroll on the course and when I say qualifications I mean like my my padmate Jake couldn't enroll on that course because he's in on remand for attempt murder which means that it was too much of a high risk to be involved in a group activity of 15 with just the coach there with us um, so, again, just like grateful for the opportunity that I, I, I could do that. Uh, I said, so things are going great. Um, I'm in playing football in the morning, sometimes in the afternoons, or I'll be gym in the morning or a theory class. Um, my the so my so the sociable sessions from five till seven on the wing. People are playing pool. Uh, I'm getting to know the lads, and I don't really have a um, a persona that you know if if. If you're not gonna like trouble me or like you know act like untoward towards me, then I'll, I won't want to do it to you. So um, I just I got on with everybody. Um, slowly and surely, it it becomes home quickly. Um, do and you often get you know you talked about some of the positive aspects of it, and you are well, you turning it into a positive, and you know you're you're filling your time now, and you're getting to know some of these lads. Do you often get a harsh reality of this is prison, and every now and then you're going to see something? That's horrendous, and there's going to be, you know, there's a lot of men that have done some serious crime locked up together. There's bound to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's bound to be things that happened, and I don't care who you are or you know how much jail time you've done or anything. When it hits home, when it's a Friday night or a Saturday night, and thank God, I, you know, I, did, uh, I don't have any children when I was in prison or anything like that, or a family myself. But when you're in, when it's Saturday night and you know, you, you should be out with your mates or spending time with your family and you're in, you're in your, your bunk with your, your, your pad mate and you're watching the sunset. Um, it's, that's when it hits home when it's like, this is just ridiculous. It, it's Saturday, it's Sunday, back to Monday, it's back to Friday again and it, the cycle just repeats and repeats. And you're seeing the world turning and you're not taking part. Literally, I'm not, because every night was a gloomy night. Just, you know, imagine, wait, imagine going to, to sleep in a cell and you're yeah, having a dream about something or a memory of you know when you was at home and then you wake up you you think you're at home in the dream and you wake up and your mates underneath you in your bed and you're thinking oh my god I mentioned the uh, the 22nd of March that was um, one of the the worst days the, um, well that was the beginning of what probably what was the worst to come for me in jail because um, my door was opened. On the 22nd of March, and I thought I was just going to play football on a normal day, and then um, the officer said that um, she literally came in and just said, Waldron. I said, Yeah, she said, uh, You've been transferred to Risley. Um, and cheekily, I replied, I'm not. Because <laughs> um, you heard about Risley? Because I heard about Risley. Um, and the key, f the key factor in why I, I didn't want to go at this time is because I'd just spoken to um, Tyler's mum recently, um, or like about a week before this, and He'd been transferred from Strange Ways to Risley himself, um, almost like a, a couple of weeks before I went. So it's like um, we were both gonna go, but it's just a case of his time come earlier than mine, and he had a spot um, before me. But he had communicated to his mum that that prison was ridiculously bad, and that's one thing that put me off because I was so settled in my football and gym routine in Forest Bank. Like not even the pull of my best friend being in that jail. Yeah, it's not enough a big enough. Drawing. It's not a big enough drawing, and and if he's telling, if he's you know getting word out to me that I I shouldn't even do that. If should the offer arise for me to come, then then don't do it. Um, it's a category C jail, Risley, so you you automatically think that you know it's better because Forest Bank's ca category B. But um, yeah, I was if I was to de to deny going, I'd have been battered probably 
um, and put in the, the van anyway. So <laughs> instead of that, I just um, I, I made sure that that was the case before I, I, I you know I was going and yeah um, I had to I had an hour to say bye to, to Jake and um, and that was it. Um, as I sent the governor on the wing to the football coach um, who had just arrived for work to plead with him to have me remain here because um, I know there was no football course in Risley and uh, he couldn't do anything about it and that was me off 20 minutes down the road from Salford um, to to Risley, Croft, Warrington um, and yeah um, so I from that first day um, I you know I arrived there I remember getting my dinner got the bare the bare minimum as a fresh prisoner on the induction wing and uh, I was put in a cell um, I'm not sure I'm pretty sure it was number six on um, on the ground floor on the induction wing and uh, I went in I went in there to set my bed up and stuff to give you a bed pack because um, you couldn't bring it from Forest Bank um, the room absolutely reeked of urine re reeked um, it had um, manure stains on the walls um, and that was kind of the, the consistent pattern with all the induction cells um, we all kind of faced the same thing. I mean, the window did open quite far, to be fair, and that was a blessing because it was hot during um, during the time in March, and um, it got the, some of the smell out as well. Um, and you can imagine myself with OCD and stuff like that was just like wow. Like I was, I was almost just a footballer in Forest Bank, and now I'm um, in a room full of urine uh, and you know, and, and manure on the, on the walls. But when I arrived there, I go back to um, the first day. Sorry. Um, I had a, you have like a little doctor check and she like goes through like your, your, um, your history and stuff and make sure you, you're not you're like entering the jail with like a, a disease or anything. Um, I was having that done, I was having my check done and there was a lad that walked past and he, he, was, on he was on the induction wing as well, but he was one of the ones that I chose to stay. Um, and he just said, you're all right lad? And I said, yeah. Are hey, you? He went, yeah. He said, welcome to Grizzly Risley. So first thing I did, I got there, I said to a lad, you know, Tyler, he said, yeah, he's just, he's just gone over there. Um, but it, that was like one of my first hap like happy memories because I, I was there, that he was, he was here at least um, on the wing. And a few hours later on, that, on their sociable time, which um, followed the same pattern as Risley, uh, as far as Bank, sorry, five till seven, I, I was re, like, reconnected with Tyler and um, it was a little bit like, not like Jake, because I didn't know Jake at the time, but it, I got to Risley, I didn't know what was going on, and then like on the fourth, fifth day, I got to see Tyler, and he was the one showing me around the whole wing, showing me what's what, who's who, and showing me the differences um, between probably what I experienced in, in uh, Forest Bank in terms of um, the facilities and what, I'd, what to expect with food and um, how the officers would act towards you and stuff. Um, I feel like almost at the, when it comes to the end, at uh, the end of my time at Risley, I feel like if I didn't go through that, them months, them four and a half months at Risley, then my jail time would have been a lot different. Um, I would have been a lad who was in Forest Bank for six months and a bit, um, playing football and going gym, um, helping the coach, coach the other lads, and almost. Um, I don't think I don't. I don't think I would have felt the full impact of what it's like to be in jail in Forest Bank, um, which is, it didn't, obviously, or, oh, I don't wish it upon anybody, but it, it helped in a way, like, to me, to me, uh, you know, sitting here today, um, the, it's a different kind of, um, you know, different kind of walls that you need to build and different kind of uh, strength that you need to gain mentally to, to actually get through. To get through it in Risley. It was a wake-up call for when you got on the outside that you were, you know, you never wanted to come back here and you weren't going to put yourself in these situations where, you know, yeah, you can get yourself in trouble. Definitely, um, and if you, I say um, in, in Forest Bank of you know realizing on Friday and Saturday nights and it hits home on Sundays and there's no family days, when you're in Risley, like it it hits home bad like badly. Um, and then I get a knock on the door uh, one Sunday. Um, so end of March, April, May, um, mid-May, and 
uh, one of the governor uh, governors comes in and knocks on the door. It's a Sunday, and it's, that's unusual because we're pretty much left alone on a Sunday. Um, and he just he asked for my name, so I replied, and he just said that um, Liverpool Football Club have been on the phone, or somebody has been, and um, they wanted to arrange a visit. Um, and it, it, they actually tried to tell um, Phil, who was uh, the coach that came to see me, that they, he'd have to wait a week, and um, he managed to fill the infill, um, get it like in the next couple of days. So he's got a way of making things. Happen. Yeah, yeah, he does. How did that make you feel when you you're seeing Liverpool almost still, you know, reach out to you and show you a bit of care that you know you, you've left this club two and a half years ago, longer than that now? And yeah. Bizarre. Yeah, still showing an interest in it. Yeah, bizarre. Um, Phil, Phil's role is like you know education and welfare of the players, and I feel that um, although it's such a it's a tough and a ruthless role to to have at the academy, I feel like um, he's the right man for the job and has been for a while um, because it, it's so tough uh, what he does. But to you know, I'm now going on a like a a visit to see Phil. Who's used used to see me in my um, you know, my training uniform is now seeing me like probably my favourite tracksuit that I had at the time, um, with a shocking haircut and um, in shocking shape, and is that just intimidating. Just I mean, down. Gonna, uh, meet him. Um, the reason why it, w it was intimidating, but with Phil, the connection that he kind of he builds with all the young players at the academy, that that's what lifted the weight off my shoulders, knowing that it was him because. I knew that him coming anyway was was a sign of him at like probably going to show support like you know he's he's heard and he's actually you know made contact with the prison that I'm in not through myself or family or anyone and um, you know he'd, he'd come in to see me and we we had a an hour an hour chat that day and um, I mentioned it was just like towards the back end of May um, and I was getting I was getting out in July and he you know he just he just gave me words of encouragement he told me to. Um, they asked me how it had been, and you know, uh, said that he, he, he actually he said something that I, I won't forget. And you know, he just said not to let anybody use this to define me ever in the future. Um, he said that you know, he knows who I am truly, and everybody at the club at the time who was with me during them six years know knows who I am. So you know, prior to me leaving prison. Um, you know, he said he wanted to connect again, but don't don't think that this is going to define you now. You know, once you, you, um, the time comes to you for leaving, and um, and yeah, it was that it was crazy just to be in, you know sat at, like literally over a desk, um, can't touch or anything like that. Obviously, it's, yeah, and that's my old my old coach of two years, and um, we I got to see him every day, of course, as he was a yeah, and still is an integral part of the the, the network there. Um, and that was that was when uh, my time in Risley was starting to pick up. Actually, um, I had like two, three gym sessions a week. Now, I um, my my canteen, my food had finally built up to you know where I was. I was never running out week by week of, with things, and um, it was never the same as Forest Bank because I wasn't playing football and stuff. And um, I feel like I was around a lot more prisoners that were out of control in Risley. And then June came, and my release date for tag was July the eighth. Um, and I had a clean run, and I, f you know, I knew that I'd, I'd probably be granted my tag, but you still have to wait and find out, you know, uh, pending assessment from the jail and stuff. And um, yeah, my, uh, the last three weeks or so is, is crazy. You start to not sleep as much, knowing that you, you know, your, your time's gonna come, and then. Um, one of the, again, one of the, the worst uh, memories um, from Risley and, and Forest Bank and all the jails times, along with seeing things like you know watching people actually pass away, watching people taking all like different kinds of drugs and reacting so violently and crazily off it. One of the worst actual moments was when me and Tyler had um, like that last little ten minute uh, conversation before I left the wing. Um, we would let out for breakfast as normal. He probably would have gone on to his job that day, and I uh, went on to reception to be checked out of the jail. Um, so that was like me knowing that I'd be uh, 
leaving him in there and then obviously going on to to serve the rest of the 22 months or so that he, he had left. His um, companionship meant a lot to you in that jail. Yeah. And therefore you knew that you were leaving him without your companionship. Yeah, you yeah. You were leaving him with. Definitely. Um, just because we know we just know each other inside out. Um, family, friend, like I, I could like walk, walk into his mum's house now, like at this time, any time, you know. Which um, leads me on to getting my uh, my tag granted, obviously, um, at the in the last week of June, and then I was released on Tuesday, um, July the 9th, so a day after um, I was eligible. Um, an unbelievable day after that, you know, I spoke to him and. Um, Checked out, of it, you know, left my clothes with people who were probably thought needed them and whatnot, and um, walked out. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm starting to smile because I can just remember my, my uh, sister's faces and, and stuff at the time. Um, an unbelievable feeling. You've got. Uh, you said you haven't got your own family. You have you got your your sisters? You got nieces? Yeah, um, sisters. Um, they, uh, my three elder sisters, they've, one's got four children, one's got three and one's got one. Um, so a couple of the younger ones, like the ages of nine and ten, one thought I was in the army and the other one thought I was working away in Switzerland and stuff, as, as I had been. Um, and to, I, the day after, um, I, I got the, they all came round and like Uncle Daz was home from work and stuff and like it hit home then like, wow, like, it's crazy, I'm, I'm home. The, re the, re the, re the relief of going to sleep in my own bed, um, the relief of the biggest, one of the biggest reliefs is that my, you know, my manager actually communicate, communicated with me and told me that, you know, he would want to meet with me soon and uh, speak about being, you know, reassembled back into work and stuff. And that was like pretty crazy because I was out on July the 9th and um, I met him on the 15th and then on the 16th. Um, I had my work boots back on, uh, back in work. And they, they stuck by you? For and that. they stuck by me. Um, throughout the time I was um, in, in jail and stuff. And uh, yeah, a week later I was back in work. And a week after that, it's like, although it looks like it's like if it's happened for everybody just looking inside, but for me, I'm still facing troubles at home, like not being able to go sleep easily because I'm thinking about Tyler or I'm thinking about like, it's just because once you're in there, even though you, I was serving, I knew I'd be serving six months for sure. Um, it it, it, can, it feels like sixty years, whether you're serving six months, six days, or you've got six years remaining. It's just a constant repeat of life every single day. So, you, 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 I almost didn't believe I was like being released on the day until I'm breathing air and on the other side of the gate. Um, we mentioned just to go back one second. We went. We mentioned Phil Roscoe being a big part and a big role model and. We also mentioned that you know when you did go to Diggs, that was another big role model, and your Diggs parent was an ex-policeman. Yeah. Did he find out you were in prison, and you know what was his reaction? It's actually, yeah, a really good point. Actually, um, so when 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 Phil come to meet me and we we spoke, um, he Phil Phil was aware of my relationship with my house parents before prison. I, I after I left Liverpool, I always like firmly. Like made it clear to him that like I was grateful that he he put me with that family um, eventually because you know they, because of how you know they treated me and the the relationship we we had, uh, now have. Um, but I I told him to tell him. Um, I didn't want to tell him myself because it you know it was tough at the time. But I felt like if if he told and uh, told him then you know that he, um, Dave my house parent. Um, the, the father could come to me in his own time. The reason why I actually mentioned it to Phil um, to, to tell him and the family is because I felt like I, I wanted them to know and that's because they, they'd done so much for me. Um, I felt like I had a little responsibility to tell them um, that you know I wasn't around and it, this had happened to me. Um, and you know we're talking about a family that I'd, um, in, I think in 2016 or in 2017 even, um, before what had happened happened, I was I went on holiday with with this family. After coming back from New York, after turning twenty, um, they they go on family holidays and invited me on one once to Portugal, um, and it 
it yet again just felt like I was back in digs, but we're on holiday um, with these two lads who are now older. Um, would have been 18 and 16 at the time, and you know, it, I've always felt like they treated me like one of their own anyway. So to to go and have that experience on holiday in um, you know a really nice holiday as well in Portugal, it made me feel like the, the, it brought back memories of me being back there in the summer in pre-season when the you know I'm looking around and feeling like you know this is what I want from my future family. Um, there's unbelievable people, but yeah, um, they were told, and um, I was released in July, and I got round to going to see um, the family when I got off tag, um, and I I got my chance to tell them everything that had happened, and um, it was, you know, they they were gobsmacked. Uh, however, they, I got no sense or feeling that he felt, um, you know, in any way towards me that because of what I'd done, like it might change his opinion or if anything like that. Instead, he came across just like Phil as an as a, um, older male figure and told me to not let it define me and that they know um, themselves that, you know, during the, the years that they spent with me, just the person who I am, um, which is really reassuring. Um, it, it was quite nerve wracking because, you know, knowing his, um, his job and stuff and uh, the respect that I have for him and his family. Um, to go and tell my whole story and stuff was crazy. But it, I mean, they did everything for me. Like, it, it, you know, Dave, he, he taught me to drive. Um, you know, we, we, I've never had an argument. We've never had an, an altercation ever. Um, lo just, lo just loving that time that I, I'm getting feeling normal. And, you know, it, uh, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, still um, to this day, uh, They'll always be part of my life, um, his children and um, him and his wife, and we'll always keep in contact. Um, and then, it, it, you know, going back to the process, going back to work and stuff, um, p people knew, but like were kind of afraid to approach me and ask me like what was like what was it like and stuff. But I've had them conversations now with everybody, and obviously they know what they know what it was like and what I went through. Um, but yeah. Like the best thing for me that could have happened was to to come out and back into the community again, go straight back into work. Um, it allowed me to resume, you know, life pretty much as what I, was, I remembered it by um, before going to prison. And after a month or so, um, July, uh, August, and you know, I'm on curfew until November, um, which has been altered from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. because of my working hours. Um, Life was almost the same every day again. Um, work, home, I, you know, I had, I'd finish at half three, four, and then from four to late to maybe see the sis, my sister's kids or do whatever act, activity I wanted. But I had, I, it took me a while to start doing things because I was just, I wanted to work and then just go home and like realize the fact I'm still home and you know I've got a tag around my ankle and then um, the August time, September is a time uh, frame where I joined Buckingfield Town and I had an ex-friend bring me down there, overweight. Um, I could play, but I needed training sessions a lot. Um, so this, this is the league below the North West Counties? Yeah, the league That's below the, league the, the North West Counties, the Manchester Premier League. Um, not the, not, a, not a, a league that I that probably matches my, uh, my football IQ or, you know, history and stuff, but a great release of me being on tag and then having a game to look forward to on Saturday, even though I've got a tag around my ankle, like, it made no difference to me. And um, we, we were first in the league um, from Christmas and onwards. And then COVID came around and, uh, and uh, ruined their, them title dreams. We were, five, we were five points clear with four games to go at the end of the season just gone. And obviously we're not the Prem, so everything was voided immediately and was gutted because we put a lot into that season. Um, you know, it's, I didn't know any of the lads at the beginning and we kind of come out like a little family at the end. And like I said, it's not just the football for me. It's, I, I love playing for them, but I love helping the people that are around me there too. Um, I've, I've had offers in higher leagues um, already, like at the beginning of this season, but um, un, unless, some, unless something really significant happens where like somebody, you know, says to me that, I don't know, maybe I should really like, stop and, and really focus in that lane. I probably, 
I, I mean, anything could happen. I don't know um, what limit or what level I'll ever. Well. So it brings us it brings us nicely to now and you know where we are at the minute. Um, you're enjoying your football. You've completely well. You've turned your life around and you've got this new mentality. You've got a good job. Um, what does the future hold? You've, you've said to us numerous times that you enjoy helping people. Do you see yourself helping? You know, you're doing that in the job at the minute, but do you see yourself trying to pass on some of your experiences to, you know, some of these academy players and you know some of these prisoners that have been in your in your shoes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of the future and and in that lane, I definitely, or uh, it is like a goal of mine to use my experiences, um, positive and negative, um, and yeah, use like something like a platform like this to be the to be the voice of a lot of people who are going through the same things all up and down the country, um, similar experiences that don't, you know, don't have a voice to reach people out there. Um, I'd love to go into academies um, or, you know, uh, organisations, uh, prisons, um, helping coaching or helping just, especially with the mental side, as I said, because people. Um, often come across as you know strong and the stable um, and it's always often not the case especially in places like academies where you're under high pressure environments every day um, and in prison where you're also under uh, high pressure environments every day um, the biggest thing for me moving forward for the future is that um, me and my partner uh, are expecting our first uh, child That's which wild. is um, an absolutely unbelievable feeling um, this is uh, I had to get permission off her actually to to say this, but um, but no, yeah. Um, about a month ago, we we found out, and um, I just felt like, and she, you know, herself the same. Um, that it was it was the right time. Um, uh, I'm in a, I'm in a stable position now, and from where I, where I am now to, you know, where I was back in, even just as early as 2019. Um, it's, it's an unbelievable difference, but I know that one of my um, you know biggest goals is definitely to give back. Even just at my young age, I feel like I've got a lot to give to to you know the teenage era of the academies, um, prisoners, and a lot to give back in terms of the sense of I helped raising my sister's children with them as well. Um, I love spending time with them, and that kind of made me paternal in a way. I mentioned about having experiences of making me want. Um, similar environments and things for my own family one day and um and yeah um she's well you know we're three months down the line now so there's not a long time to go it's um, a lovely um it's a lovely way until to until next year have, you know we've we've got to know you a little bit over this over yeah. the last month and this is the first we've heard about it and um it is you can you know a lot of your experiences bring you to this moment and it's it's another chapter and it's another purpose for you and um yeah, it does. It, I can see my ovary probably getting a bit emotional. Yeah, 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 definitely, <laughs> mate. I mean, look, I, I probably shouldn't say this because I will make myself emotional, but I think you will be a fantastic dad. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And I, I'm sad that you had to go through the experiences that you've gone through to learn what you've learned through life and what you've packed in in your 23 years is is, is phenomenal. And um, you know, you, you because you've learned a lot, you've got a lot to give. And, yeah, um, I feel that. Myself. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I'm over the moon to hear that. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm, I'm over the moon myself. Amazing. Um, Darius, thank you. Well, thank you yeah, as well. Time, oh, I just want to clap. <laughs> <laughs>Thanks for listening to this episode of Football Journeys um, and thank you to all those who supported us. Do come and find us on social media at Journeys Pod on both Twitter and Instagram where we'll be sharing more content. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us on footballjourneys at b5consultancy.com or visit our webpage b5consultancy.com slash footballjourneys. This podcast is produced by B5 Consultancy alongside Ricky Valentine, who himself had an academy journey with me at Brentford FC. Special thanks goes to the Hope Street Hotel for their hospitality and Liverpool FC for supplying some of their archive footage. Lastly, thanks to the lads for telling their stories and to the contributors who gave up their time to share their memories of the lads. Please do like and subscribe. If you feel we deserve a five-star rating, then please give us one. The more successful this podcast is, the better chance we have of producing more, more episodes and further series.